Well, you know, I dropped out of high school at 15. Uh, I went to prison three times, was in a homeless shelter three times, <laughs> and got divorced three times. I'm not really sure I've had any serious setbacks. But raising your prices and not controlling labor is an operational problem. It yeah. becomes a financial problem, and ultimately it becomes a human resource problem. Listen, I'm not only an employee, I'm a shareholder. And if you don't know how to best use the, the talent that you have, I'm probably better off going my own way. And I, and I jump ship. Hey guys, if you're enjoying these episodes here of our Unfiltered Podcast, be sure and join us live in Las Vegas because if you think it's fun watching, it's going to be a way more fun if you're there with us in the audience. Have a glass of whiskey and some good conversation. Get registered at epic2020event.com. So let me ask you this question. So that decision uh, cost millions of dollars in, in equity for the various people. Hundreds lots, of millions. Hundreds of millions, lots of jobs cost you personally millions of dollars. Uh, a lot of heartache, a lot of, a lot of money lost. What would your advice be to a company? That's the macro picture, right? So small individual contractor, he wants to go to flat rate. Yep. What would your advice to him be to make sure that it's, that it's uh, uh, implement, implemented properly and gets the results that they want? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, EGI has a tremendous amount of resources. So if you just logged onto the site and you looked at, you know, flat rate pricing, there's actually an action plan for all the project steps that you would want to execute before you implemented flat rate. Yeah. So it really doesn't matter what flat rate system you're using. It does matter that you understand how you have to train the techs, you know, how you're gonna organize, how you're gonna account, um, looking at invoices, uh, reviewing those on a weekly, monthly basis. And so there, there is literally an action plan that I've written that has about 25 steps to make sure that we don't make that Type right. of mistake again. Yeah, because you hear contractors, I'm going to flat rate, I'm going to go to flat rate, go yeah. to flat rate. Yeah. But they're but you gotta think about these other operational issues. Yeah, it's all it's it, it. It, yeah. So marketing, finance, production, and human resources are horizontal, they all affect each other. So it's great to go out and raise your prices, but raising your prices and not controlling labor is an operational problem. It yeah. becomes a financial problem and ultimately it becomes a human resource problem. We start cutting salaries or laying people yeah. off, or in our case, we started closing centers and you know, doing things to defend the, the company and the brand. And ultimately we sold that business to Lennox. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's one of those things that you should actually have a game plan. And the other thing I would suggest is you talk to four or five companies that have done it and uh, just, you know, make sure that you do your network. So Wally, I would call you and say, you know, how do I get better at this? And uh, you've done it. And so you talk to people that have executed that, they'll give you great insights. And so EGIA has that platform to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, I was collateral damage in that, that decision. So, uh, <laughs> you and a lot of other people. Yeah, because I was. Uh, Get in line, pal. <laughs> I came over, you know, after we sold our, our company to the utility, I came over and, and joined uh, Service Experts and was there for about 18 months. And as this was kind of going down, I saw the issue. The other thing that, the other thing that they also did, uh, by the way, is they shifted from a uh, comfort advisor sales model to a technician sales model. And so that, in my opinion, exacerbated the problem. And I was trying to get, I even wrote a position paper on it to, to, you know, to Ron Smith at the time, which I, is, I've turned into an article that's, the article's actually on the EGI website. <clears throat> and um, because I, I believe that you could sell your way out of this, right? I mean, that's what I learned. And you're giving these opportunities to technicians and technicians aren't turning them into the, what they could be, right? right? They're getting something, but they're not getting what a comfort advisor would. And I got a call on a Sunday night from my, my boss at the time, and who was a district manager. And I was walking out of a Robert, Com Robert Palmer concert with my then wife. And I, it was just literally a Sunday night. And he said, uh, you know, of course the stocks- The initials are AB, aren't they? AB, you got it. <laughs> and the, uh, the stock's down at $6. And you know, I wrote this position paper, I'd come down, they talked to me about you know, all these opportunities that they, they wanted me to consider. And they calls me on a Sunday night, like three months after my visit to Nashville, and he says, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I, I, I was actually, he was, he was going to take over running troubled centers, fixing, fixing troubled centers, which is what I was doing for 18 months. And I said, I want to do that with him, but I don't want to do it the way that I'm doing it because you're sending me into a, a center for six months at a time. I want to work with multiple centers. Anyway, long story short, um, it was just a series of bad decisions, right? And I said, I said to him, I said, listen, I'm not only an employee, I'm a shareholder. And if you don't know how to best use the, the talent that you have, I'm probably better off going my own way. 
and I, and I jumped ship and literally like, so that was August of 99 and they sold in October of 99. And, and, and so, uh, I, you know, what we're hearing here in, in that particular situation, you know, every problem we probably have started out as a good idea, right? And that, that started I think out as it's a good idea. important to recognize too <laughs> that like the, that, 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 um, uh, company was populated with some of the smartest people yeah. in the industry. It's not like there wasn't a lot of talent. There's there. A lot of talent. Uh, so organizationally, it was driven by hubris and greed, and you know a philosophy that wasn't a good philosophy. And so that that's another part of the autopsy. So when yeah. we talk about culture in our business, how we try to do things, um, we want to do things culturally the right way. We want to take care of our people. And we don't want to let our ego and our hubris get in the way of how we roll out decisions yeah. and those types of things. And it's very easy and it's repeating itself right now. As a matter of fact, consolidation is back. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, well, you know, we're, we're right back into that same space. So, you know, I think there's there's a tremendous amount of lessons to be learned. Yeah. So, Certainly. hey, I got a I got a list, Wally. This video is not going to be long <laughs> enough. So, I mean, but that's that's the one that's probably the most well, expensive lesson. I, I think when you take away from that, the, 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 the other lesson is the hubris and the ego. Alan. Yeah important that is to keep in check. Well, there were also fiefdoms that developed, right? Everybody's trying to keep theirs and protect theirs. Right. Yeah, they all wanted to get theirs. So what do you got for yeah. us, brother? Well, you know, I dropped out of high school at 15. Uh, I went to prison three times, was in a homeless shelter three times, <laughs> and got divorced three times. I'm not really sure I've had any serious setbacks, uh, you know, in my life. Uh, I think my biggest challenge, professionally at least, uh, I got out of the joint in 2003. Uh, in June of 2003, you hired me, not for your company, but for a client of yours. Uh, I started making money, went out, sold $149,000 in my first month, uh, which was July of 2003. A year later, I opened my own company, two million our first year, three and a half million our second year, and I'm full of hubris and ego. I'm too big for my britches. So in early 2007, got the bright idea, let's start buying some companies. Bought uh, three or four competitors in town, and in the course of that, borrowed a lot of money, didn't buy them right, uh, took on a lot of debt and the money that I borrowed and re, you know, payables they had that I assumed and different things. And uh, when it was all said and done by mid 2007, uh, I owed about a million and a half dollars. And then 2008 hit, 2009, and you know, the economy started declining and business got really slow. And uh, I remember in uh, 2008, things were getting pretty stressful. And I was actually on a flight on my way out to Maui and I couldn't even relax. I just, the, the, the debt was building, the stress, the cash flow was so tight. And I got to Maui on a Friday night and I got back on a plane Saturday night and came, took a red eye home and got home Sunday morning and got my team together. I said, guys, we got some serious, serious problems. And one of those problems, among other issues, we had really bad overhead, really high overhead. And I owed a supplier almost a half a million dollars, 480 grand. Part of that was some money I still owed from the companies that I bought that I assumed their liabilities. And then what we had, probably 60 days of payables to our distributor, it was 480 grand. And they were calling me like, hey, we gotta work something out. We gotta work something out. And for about a month and a half, I kind of ignored those calls. I'll get caught up, I'll get caught up. And then one day I get a phone call from my general manager and he said, hey, the phones are ringing off the hook. We have homeowners calling that have all received notices of liens. And the distributor got tired of messing around with me and they filed 200 notice of liens to our customers. And of course the phone started going crazy, customers calling, the local news station got involved, the consumers report, whatever. And- These are not leads, these are collection calls. Collection calls. <laughs> People saying, why do I have a lien? Why am I getting a notice of lien? Yeah. I mean, you know, you aren't paying your bills or whatever. We're on the news that night. And it was a very, very stressful situation. Uh, that after that very same afternoon, I went up, I met with the distributor and we signed a promissory note for 480 grand to pay it back in 24 months. They got my attention. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, and that, that was by that time was 2008 and the economy wasn't getting any better at that time. And we just had to learn how to sell better. And so we, we redoubled our efforts in getting good at when we got an opportunity at the kitchen table to close the deal at proper margins. And we sold ourselves out of that situation. Uh, I paid that note off in 20 months, every dime of it and uh, about a year later then sold the company. But uh, that was, uh, it was so close in 2008, 2009, there was a time where my accountant and my lawyer said, dude, why don't you just file bankruptcy? I mean, it's your only way out. 
And the only reason I didn't, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a, a character issue. People file bankruptcy. They have to reorganize sometimes. I get it. But because of my background, that was the play people would expect from me. And I've always been very sensitive about not playing into the stereotype of what people expect. So we didn't. And we paid off everything and, and got out of it. But, man, it was, uh, it was a hairy, hairy situation. But what I learned from that lesson is just the importance of the marketing and getting really good at the sales. That the sales function has to be, I'm not saying it's more important than operations. I'm not saying it's more important than great service tax and great installations. But it has to be equally as important. It's one of the business functions that all too often doesn't get taken seriously in our industry. It's almost like, oh, find somebody else to do the sales. We don't want to mess with the sales. But, you know, if you look at, at the four core business functions, accounting, human resource, operations, and sales and marketing, it's one of the four key components or four components of a business. And you got to be just as good at that as you do everything else. And so we got out of that mess, and, uh, but it was an important lesson to learn. And it's, it's kind of funny because what you talked about with your dad's company, you guys got better at marketing. We got better at sales. It's probably no surprise that that's kind of my, you know, that's the thing I preach. You got to get better at sales. Uh, one of you just mentioned a moment ago that when you start selling at better margins, that solves a lot of problems, you know. And uh, I remember one time I was listening to you speak. We were here in Scottsdale at a different hotel a few years ago, and you were talking for about 90 minutes about operating the service department profitably, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you got finished, and I'm like, how the hell did I make it in this business? Because I didn't know any of the stuff you were talking about. And I, I told you that after we, after we spoke, and you said, you know, the one thing you did right is you sold a lot at good margins, and that saved your bacon. So, yeah, uh, everybody watching this podcast, all of us have had challenges, and it's the, the difficulties that you learn from, the lessons that you guys have talked about that you learn from that. That's the real learning. As I often say, I, I learned very little from my successes. Half the time, I don't know why I was successful when something worked out. But when you have those kind of failures, those kind of struggles, boy, it, 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 and, and you mentioned you got to be aware of it. Yeah. You have to, you have to be aware, know why it's painful, what you did. You got to figure that out. Then you can grow and learn from it. Can I, uh, can I throw out the process that we use? Yeah. Uh, we, we, we've installed a discipline, basically a business process, uh, to how we do the autopsy. We call it a start, stop, keep conversation. Uh, we do that weekly in the management team meeting. So we literally say, is there anything we should be doing you know, do we need to sell better? Do we need to raise our prices? You know, are we closing the lead? So we, we go through, what do we need to start? Uh, we talk about what do we need to stop? So that catches the discussions about, all right, you know, th this isn't working right. Maybe we shouldn't be doing that. And so the, the stop conversation is then that, that cues the autopsy. Why did we do it? What happened? What did we learn from it? We literally have a checklist of questions that we go through and we talk about it as a management team to say, we need to be better at this. Like, let's, let's learn our lessons. So we've installed that in our weekly management discussions that the autopsy is cultural now. So it, it keeps us from being too hubris, too arrogant, yep. you know, and just getting too full of ourselves about, well, we're pretty good at this because the economy is pretty good right now. And, you know, I, I, there's a lot of people that are doing a lot of new construction and this cycle will have its time mm -hmm. and it will probably have its end. And so you, you want your business to be tight. You want to sell well, you want to operate well, you want to have good training in people and you want to have, you know, good procedures, you know, from the standpoint of accounting and finance. So the start, stop, keep conversations are part of how we keep that, basically keep our head on straight. Yeah, I, I love that. And, uh, you know, one I've kind of been sharing <clears throat> with my clients and in EGI training events, it's similar, um, you know, maybe a little different in the way of phraseology. But, you know, Russ and I always talk about it as well. You're either winning or you're learning. You're not losing. You got to find the lesson because, you know, it's there. There's, there, you know, there are lessons, like you say, in winning, but you, like you said, the, your best lessons come from when you're failing or losing, but it's not really losing if you learn the lesson, right? A gentleman and I went, you know, I went and saw him not too long ago uh, at an event. He, uh, he made $150 million in, in real estate and, you know, in the boom of the time like you were talking about. And his ego and his hubris got in the way and, and the, you know, the, the, lesson, the, the signs were there for him to move, but he didn't because he thought he could ride it out. In fact, I, two, two guys I, I, I work with in my uh, coaching practice um, have done this in real estate. And, um, but the one guy said, you know, he let his ego get in the way and he says, business is not an emotional sport. It does not respond well to glands, right? And, but that's how he kind of played it out. And he lost $150 million. And he gets, he has gotten asked many times over the years, you know, what's it feel like to, 
to lose $150 million? And he, of course, he's sick and tired of the question. He's, what, what do you think it feels like to lose $150 million, right? Okay. Um, he, he, says, he says, I look at it this way. He goes, it's a tuition that I got to pay. And there's very few people who get to pay that tuition. The question is not, was it worth it? Is, or the question isn't, you, you know, what does it feel like? The question is, was it worth it? Did I get a lesson? And he has since made back the 150 million and then some. And, and, and so, uh, yeah, I think that's kind of like either, you're either winning or you're learning. And, uh, you know, we went on to have a conversation about it. I actually approached him I, and I asked him a little bit deeper probing questions about, so help me understand, you know, when you went through this, what were you thinking? You know, did you see it coming? And, and he, he was very candid with me. And he says, as entrepreneurs, we always, we always see the upside. We always see the opportunity. We're optimists. We are optimists. We see things with rose-colored glasses. We, and, and we believe in ourselves, right? So we double down on ourselves and we will bet on ourselves nine ways to Sunday. Because we, we don't think that we can fail. But we fail to see that there's maybe other people involved. There's, there's circumstances of, of the market and whatnot. And so we see the upside we don't tend to look to see what the downside is. And so he said, I always looked at the upside. He goes, now I look at the downside. He says, you know, I see the upside, is the upside worth it? And he says, and I, I look at the downside and he says, can I live with it? If everything went wrong, could I still live with it? And he says, then I'll make my decision. So look at the upside, look at the downside, and can you live with the downside? Good stuff. We, uh, we have one more thing we need to sort of interject in that. We have this business model now where we have the KPIs for pretty much every one of the verticals now. Every one. You know, back at the service experts days, we were formulating a lot of that. So one of the things we'd like the EGI members to do is instead of not looking at the analytics, you know, use your accounting system to tell you when it's not working well so that you don't get too far in. And so that, that negative risk that you're talking about, right? It, it will show itself in your numbers. And that's a weakness in the trade. We need to be good in the trade at all four disciplines that you talk about. So you can overcome a lot of problems by selling, uh, but if I'm doing that new construction and new construction goes away, how do I analyze that in order to figure that out? So the metrics and the KPIs are part of how we do that. So just throwing that out there. So I think the lesson to our viewers, our listeners in this podcast, is that everybody has difficult times and there's people out there right now that have their backs against the wall in their business and they're probably wondering, how do I get out of it? Am I going to be able to get out of it? I think the answer is a resounding yes. You just got to look at the KPIs, market better, sell better, cut overhead, do what you got to do. I love that line. It's not an emotional deal. Business is not emotional. And, uh, and just know that you can get out of it. We've done it. We all have worked with the companies that, that have gotten out of those situations. And so people right now that feel like, uh, what am I going to do? How am I going to make payroll next week? Uh, you just got to keep fighting. Yeah. Make the changes. The, the, the autopsy, as you refer to it, figure out what you did wrong and change it. I tell people all the time, there's nothing that can't be fixed. Yeah. Nothing. I, I've yet to see a company that can't be repaired and fixed. You just have to decide, you know, the courage to adjust, which your father and you did. Best line I ever heard is every problem man has, hum, humans have, uh, humans created. So every, every problem can be solved by a human. And, and just on the other side of adversity is usually a breakthrough. Yeah. But you gotta be willing to push on through. You know, the, the pain is real, but in the pain is the gift of the lesson. If you learn the lesson, on the other side of that lesson is the breakthrough. There's a great chapter in Think and Grow Rich called Three Feet from Gold. Yeah. About a guy who left Maryland and came out west to dig for gold and uh, spent six months and gave up and sold his mining claim. And, and the guy that bought the mining claim went up and hit one of the largest gold mining veins and, Colorado money history. And he found that gold three, exactly three feet from where uh, the other guy had stopped digging. Acres of diamonds. Acres of diamonds, same thing. So good advice guys, as always, appreciate it. And uh, look forward to sharing some more whiskey and cigars with you guys. Cool, it's always good. Cheers, man. Cheers. Cheers. Great job. <laughs>